Hello and welcome to Seven Days of Science. In the headlines this week, the head of the giant prehistoric millipede Arthropleura has finally been discovered. A new specimen of a giant predatory dinosaur from South America has been found. Evidence of more Spinosaurus in Morocco has been uncovered. And much, and much more. more. Also, we've got a very important announcement to make. The three of us are here to tell you today, after more than six and a half years, Seven Days of Science is finally coming to an end on this channel. Well, it's moving to a new one. It's not. It, we're moving. It's we're moving, moving to, to a new channel. channel. Yes. Keep it's watching to the end for more details. Well, how did you get in? <laughs> how did either of you get in? You left the door open. It was easy. You don't want to know. And be sure to subscribe to the new home of Seven Days. Of subscribe Science. to the new channel and and the and new. And link will be in the description. And the new Instagram. More details at the end. Woo! More details at the end. Bloody hell. Starting off the news this week, we've got a couple of fabulous space exploration stories. First off, SpaceX has had another wildly successful Starship test this week, with the main ship completing its full flight plan, including a soft landing in the sea, which is in preparation for tests where it will fully re-land. Testing landing capabilities for this rocket is important not just for returning astronauts, cargo and the craft itself back to Earth, but also serving as a lander on the moon and potentially other planets. Starship has been selected by NASA as the lander for their Artemis III mission, planned for 2026. When complete and fully operational, Starship will be the biggest rocket ever to launch from Earth in terms of payload capacity, and will be a massive change in how we go to space, as both parts of the rocket, both the Starship upper stage and the super heavy booster lower stage, will be reusable. Sunday's Starship 5 flight test was a particularly important milestone in this journey, as SpaceX were able to complete a launch with the super heavy booster, turn it around and fire it back at the launch pad, and then they caught the lower stage with the launch tower, using their so-called chopstick arms to do so. This is an incredible feat of science and engineering, and is a great step forward for the US-based team as they look to bring Starship to a fully operational status. In our second bit of spaceship-based news this week, NASA's Europa Clipper spacecraft has launched and is on its way to Europa, a moon of Jupiter. Europa is often seen as a promising potential candidate for life in our solar system outside of Earth. It's believed that the environment underneath the icy surface of the moon may well hold the right characteristics for life, with the right temperatures and a well-oxygenated environment. Much of the data we have about Europa comes from the Juno spacecraft that passed back in September of 2022, with some extra data coming from the Galileo spacecraft in 2003. Europa Clipper, when it arrives at Europa in 2030, will gather a massive amount of unique and important data to help us understand the moon. NASA plans to use the craft to map Europa's surface and also fly through plumes of water violently ejected from the surface. It will capture samples from these plumes and send the data gathered from this capture back to Earth, where it can be analysed to help us get closer to answering the question, does life exist somewhere other than Earth? And the space station, I guess. Also in the news, recent research has shown that our warming oceans will increase the risk of collisions between ships and whale sharks. These majestic giants cruise slowly near the surface as they feed on plankton, rarely moving faster than a human walking, making them particularly vulnerable to ship strikes. The research was carried out by an international team of scientists involved in the Global Shark Movement Project. They used over 15 years worth of satellite tracking data from almost 350 tagged whale sharks. The movement of whale sharks was matched to temperature, salinity and other environmental conditions to determine what sort of habitat they are likely to live in. Using climate change models, these environmental conditions were projected forward in time to reveal which parts of the ocean would have these conditions in the future. The shift in the range of their preferred habitat means that it overlapped with regions that are home to some of the world's busiest seaports and shipping highways. Sadly, the scientists found that the co currents between sharks and ships will be 15,000 times greater by the end of this century if we continue to rely heavily on fossil fuels. It's difficult to say by how much ship strikes with whale sharks will increase, but increased mortality is a very real possibility. 
Up next, we have the ultimate nerd news as seven new species of tree frogs from Madagascar have all been named after captains from Star Trek, making Ben incredibly happy. The tree frog species Bufus marajazenis inhabits the rainforests of Madagascar and creates a distinctive sound, which scientists have said sounds a bit like the communicators in Star Trek. By analysing the DNA, anatomy and bioacoustics of the tree frogs, the researchers have found that eight different species can actually be recognised, instead of just the one. So they name the seven new species after Star Trek captains. Obviously. These are Bufus kirkii, Bufus picardii, Bufus siskoi, Bufus janewayi, Bufus archerii, Bufus pikei and Bufus burnamii. The authors also explain how, appropriately, the discovery of these frog species involved a lot of trekking through remote mountains and forests. And, and as they say, there's a real sense of scientific discovery and exploration here, which we think is in the spirit of Star Trek. Some fantastic frog news. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we've got a very exciting story as everyone's favourite giant prehistoric millipede, Arthropleura, has had a bit of a redesign. This gigantic arthropod lived during the Carboniferous and early Permian periods, achieving lengths of potentially more than 2.6 metres or 8.6 feet, so it was quite possibly the largest arthropod to ever live. The diet of this huge invertebrate has long been the subject of debate too, with some claims that it was carnivorous, but more recent studies support a more herbivorous diet. Since most of the known fossils of Arthropleura are quite incomplete, many details of its lifestyle have remained a mystery. However, this new research has now analysed some particularly well-preserved fossils found in France, and using micro-CT scanning, they've been able to reveal some never-before-seen bits of Arthropleura anatomy, including the head. The head anatomy is now much better understood, and it turns out that Arthropleura had eyes on stalks, which is very unlike the eyes of living millipedes. They also show antennae with seven segments in front of these eyes, plus they can see details of the mandibles. So what does this mean for the diet? Well, they support the idea that Arthropleura was a detritivore, slowly moving about the Carboniferous forest floors and consuming pretty much anything it fancied. It doesn't have specialised appendages for delivering venom, like is seen in predatory centipedes, nor does it have modified limbs of the head for prey capture, like in arachnids. So carnivory is unlikely, and it's more plausible that it was a detritus feeder like living millipedes. These new fossils also tell us more about how Arthropleura is related to millipedes. It turns out that it does actually have some features of the head appendages that resemble modern centipedes. So overall, it's got a mix of both centipede and millipede characteristics. Arthropleura therefore seems to represent a sort of transitional stage in the evolution of these arthropods and branches off near the stem of the millipede group in this new evolutionary tree. Lots of fascinating new things we've learned about this animal then. Time to send Nigel Marvin back in time to catch another one. Also in the recent paleo news, a new specimen of a formidable South American predatory dinosaur has been found that tells us a lot more about this particular species. It comes from a species called Toro Veneta violanity, with Toro Veneta translating as bull hunter. This was a large Carcharodontosaurid theropod that was very closely related to Giganotosaurus, Mapusaurus and Meraxes, and the fossils were found in Patagonia. Toro venata was originally named in 2016, based on a single isolated bone from this skull. But this new discovery includes much more of the skeleton, with various other skull bones found along with several neck bones, nearly complete forelimbs, bits of the hind limbs, ribs, a couple of backbone fragments and a bone from its tail. Toro venator is therefore found to have neck vertebrae with very tall spines that also interlock with one another like roof tiles, similar to what's seen in the older Carcharodontosaurid Acrocanthosaurus from North America. This Carcharodontosaurid neck anatomy contrasts quite significantly with other giant theropod groups, so it probably reflects a different mode of feeding that required the very large skulls of the animal to be stabilised. The forelimbs of Toro Veneta were also proportionally very small, confirming that the Giganotosaurines showed a similar trend to other large theropod groups, such as the Tyrannosaurs, in which their arms became reduced in later species. So lots of amazing discoveries about Toro Veneta, which I have a feeling is about to become a lot of people's new favourite dinosaur. Not mine though, Parasaurolophus for the win. 
Also in this week's paleontology news is the discovery that some of the birds that lived in the Hell Creek formation of North America were raptoral predators. These birds are all members of an extinct bird lineage, the Inantiornithines, which were very diverse during the Cretaceous period. Three new specimens have been described from the famous Hell Creek formation, the home of T. rex, two of which represent new species. One is named Avisaurus darwini and the other Magnusavis ecalachiensis, while the third is an unnamed species of Avisaurus. By looking at the anatomy of the limb bones found for these species, the researchers found that they show many similarities in their anatomy and certain muscle attachment points to modern birds of prey, such as hawks and owls. Their legs and feet therefore seem to have been suited to gripping and carrying heavy prey items. Yet another reason that life as a small mammal in Hell Creek would have been, well, hellish. Even the smallest dinosaurs there were deadly. And lastly for this week's Paleo News, researchers have published a work that describes 11 new specimens of carnivorous dinosaurs from the Kemkem group of Morocco, the home of Spinosaurus. These specimens are all rather isolated and fragmentary, but several of them can be identified as Spinosaur remains while one is part of the hip girdle from an unidentified Carcharodontosaurid. The study also provides a very detailed redescription of one of the best preserved snouts of a Spinosaurid found so far, a specimen in the collection of the London Natural History Museum. Not only that, but one of the specimens the researchers described is a neck vertebra from the controversial Spinosaur Sigilmatosaurus, which might have been another species that coexisted with Spinosaurus, although other paleontologists think it's just the same thing as Spinosaurus. The study therefore concludes that Spinosaurs could have been quite diverse in the Chemchem, and they encourage further study of all the bones discovered in Morocco to learn more about how many Spinosaurs might have been living here. We've also got a bit of archaeology news, as a team of archaeologists from the University of Chester have uncovered ruins of a Roman settlement and a rare medieval longhouse in Wrexham in northeast Wales. During an excavation at a site near the Holt Roman tile and pottery works in Wrexham, structural features and materials were unearthed. In addition to the settlement and longhouse, they found a trackway, structures, building materials and ceramics, including a stamped legionary tile and a fragment of a brooch. The team are yet to begin post-excavation investigations, but this discovery alone is extremely important in building a bigger picture of Roman Wrexham. Although early medieval longhouses have been found in other parts of Wales, something of this calibre is extremely rare in northeast Wales. It may be just another piece of history discovered in a fairly remote part of the UK, but every new location like this can give us incredibly valuable information on how these people lived and is an opportunity to discover something new and truly fascinating. So we're very much looking forward to seeing what discoveries come out of this new site and what historians can gather from all this new stuff. And finally for the news this week, researchers excavating Tam Pa Ling, also known as the Cave of Monkeys, in northeastern Laos, have recovered fossil evidence for some of the earliest Homo sapiens present in mainland Southeast Asia. Using a technique known as microstratigraphy, the team were able to reconstruct past cave conditions, allowing them to identify traces of human activities in and around Tam Pa Ling. Until now, a detailed analysis of the sediments surrounding these fossils, deposited in the cave between 86,000 to 30,000 years ago, had not been conducted. This analysis of the sediment allows archaeologists to observe structures and features that preserve information about past environments and potentially even traces of human and animal activity that may have been overlooked during the excavation process. The team revealed that conditions in the cave fluctuated dramatically, going from a temperate climate with frequent wet ground conditions to becoming seasonally dry. The question of how early Homo sapiens came to be buried deep within the cave has long been debated, but the sediment analysis conducted in this paper indicates the fossils were washed into the cave during periods of heavy rainfall. The researchers also identified preserved traces of charcoal and ash in the cave sediments, thus suggesting either forest fires occurred in the region during the drier periods, or the humans visiting the cave may have used fire. This research has given way to unprecedented insights into the lives of our ancestors, as they dispersed throughout the jungle of Southeast Asia, and a deeper understanding of some already incredible fossils. A truly incredible study to finish on.
Well, that's it for this week's Seven Days of Science. Do hope you enjoyed. And as we mentioned at the beginning, we've got a new Seven Days of Science channel now. So please go and subscribe to that because in the future, that's where all the Seven Days of Science is going to be. So go and subscribe to the new channel, please. We also have a new exclusive Instagram for our Seven Days of Science episode. So please go and follow that and like everything that's on there already. <laughs> The videos won't be going up on the new channel for a while. It will still be continuing on this channel for a few weeks. Exact date is to be decided, but do be sure you go and subscribe. We're hoping to make the new show even bigger and better than before and cover broader science topics, but also still focusing on paleontology. Well, what? So subscribe so you don't miss out. Okay, well, I hope you enjoy this episode of Seven Days of Science. And as always, we'll see you on Sunday. We actually will this time. Will we? Yeah. Really? Oh, nice. Yeah. There you go. We will see. There you go. Um, why are you still here? Why haven't you gone and subscribed to the new channel? And why haven't you gone and followed the new Instagram? Yeah, why haven't you liked the posts? I can feel it in my mind. See, that was just ruder, wasn't it? That was <laughs> like, I was, I was being like what? stern, but nice. You didn't say anything. No, I'm, I'm giving them a look. And that's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. I love it. I love yeah. condensation. Well, I'm telling yes. them how it it's needs to be. It's very moist. <laughs> no, Cleo, the condensation. <laughs> oh man. Go subscribe to the new channel. Please. How do we get out of here?